I am find this creature extremely charming. It's got a very winning aspect to it. Smile at the camera. Hi, I'm Dylan Thuritz, co-founder of Atlas Obscura. I'm Jessica Hester, staff writer at Atlas Obscura. And today, Jess and I are going to be talking to six employees of the Field Museum, an incredible natural history museum in Chicago, Illinois. But of course, they are not at the Field Museum. They are at their homes. Yeah, they're inviting us inside to go see the amazing stuff that they've got in their living rooms and just all over their apartments. Still any ready to do it? I am. Let's go see their stuff. I'm a paleontologist, digital media coordinator, exhibitions developer, postdoctoral researcher, PR and science communications manager, collections digitization specialist. You do seem to have some cool things in your home. So what are you what are you going to share with us today? This is my fox molder. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, when I first got him, he was just displayed in the open air. So I decided I wanted to build him a little kind of diorama enclosure. Um, the dioramas are one of my favorite things at the Field Museum. They're just these perfect snapshots of nature in ways that I'm never gonna see it in real life because um, everything is just right there. This is one of the world's largest millipedes. It's an wow. African giant black millipede. Oh, man. And she's about 10 inches long. They do get to be about 15 inches. And they live, they could live in upwards of 10 years. Wow. That is amazing. I, I find this creature extremely charming. It's got a very winning aspect to it. Millipedes are detritivores. Smile at the camera, which means they eat decaying organic matter, primarily plant detritus. And so that makes them excellent nutrient recyclers. They put a lot of nutrients back into the soil. So they're very essential. So this was a, a cat skin of one of my stick bugs it basically uses gravity to help it come out of the skin yeah yeah where would it where would it exit if, if you so there's this this um hole and tear in the back of it you can sort of see it um it, the tail's not covering it but it just sort of like pulls itself out using gravity um and what i found incredibly interesting about these molts is that in order to get oxygen they have these sort of tubes that go into their body. And you'll actually see the skin from the tubes um, as like sort of these tendrils um, getting also a metamorphosis, like the skin from those tubes is coming out as well. I have my, my very first taxidermy that I ever did. This is a Douglas squirrel and um, he, looks, he looks pretty good and he hangs around in my house. So did you make these for research or just as like buddies. So it's not for research, um, but kind of the reason that I got into it was because I was involved in it for research purposes. A lot of people don't know that the field is an active research institution with hundreds of scientists behind the scenes, always discovering cool stuff. I'm a paleontologist and I study um, the ancestors of mammals and dinosaurs, which lived between 250 and 200 million years ago. This is my uh, cuttlefish air plant holder. Oh my gosh, it's so cute! And yeah, and I, I made this myself. <laughs> when you're making pottery, though, do you like? Is there any part of your science brain that turns on? And like, is it important to you to get it? In oh a yeah. <laughs> even even when I was little, actually, um, my pottery teacher was quite struck by how I would keep my animals very like scientifically accurate. We have specimens that are preserved in alcohol at the Field Museum by the hundreds and thousands. Um, it's a good way to transport things back to the museum and to keep them safe so that scientists can learn from them for decades, centuries even. Mine is not a research specimen. One of my best friends got it for me for Christmas and uh, when she picked it up, her Uber driver kind of looked back at her holding this big old shark and said, ma'am, I am so sorry, I, your fish does not look well, I don't think it has enough water. And she was like, no, 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 he's super dead, it's fine. Um, <laughs> that, would be, that would be very concerning if that was someone's pet. 
this <clears throat> is an emperor scorpion. Oh, man. These are found in rainforests and savannas of Western Africa. So the, um, the millipedes and the scorpions would not encounter each other. For the best, I think. <laughs> no, absolutely. All scorpions fluoresce. Oh, yeah. It's, it's actually glowing. I mean, in the dark, it would be really significant. Do we know why they fluoresce? It's so funny. It is still a mystery. So many, so many scientists have studied it. And they think it may be a way for them to find each other. Um, maybe a way to ward off predators. But uh, yeah, they don't really know. I mean, there's a, there's a special protein in the, in the layer of their exoskeleton. And even in death, even after they've died, they still glow, which is so cool because scorpion fossils glow as well. Are you worried at all about holding this giant scorpion? No. Her sting would probably be comparable to a bee sting. It's a large wasp. The way that it's pinned um, is pretty unique and artistically done. Um, the way that all the pins are sort of carefully placed so that all the limbs, including the wings, um, and the antenna are all out and displayed and flayed out so that you can see every point of articulation. The way it's pinned is kind of uh, an example of the care and precision that went into the work. Oh, absolutely. This is Hans Molman. <laughs> 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 so here he is with his little face and he's got these big digging feet. Very alarming Ooh. feet. Yeah, they're extremely alarming and if you see <laughs> If you look at a mole skeleton, they're absolutely insane looking. It's like uh, if you went to the gym every day and only did arm exercises and never did leg day. Because that's, <laughs> that's what moles do. They just like, their hands are kind of positioned like this. And mm -hmm. the part of their, their skeleton that um, is the shoulder part is absolutely nuts looking. So their arms are kind of like this all the time. And when they dig, they press up and to the side. So that's his back feet. Okay, they're kind tiny. Of, they're, they're just little, and his tiny little tail. <laughs> and then this is the front feet. You have an awesome plant behind you too. How did you get into yes. it? Yes, when I um, am in the field in particular, I often notice the plants around me and often will take a cutting of something that I see and, and propagate it. When I was in South Africa, I did that quite a lot, but Obviously, I couldn't bring those plants over to Chicago when I moved here. Um, That's such but a cool bit, idea, yeah. like the, the going into the field and making a record of sort of the places that you've been and the work that you've done and then having your house reflect that. Yeah, definitely. Like all good museum folks, I love collecting stuff, but I live in an apartment that is small. And so I've started building kind of like little mini rooms. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. So I actually made this couch and I like stitched all these like little tiny pillows, which are really fun. And then a friend gave me this rug, which he bought from, I think, Macedonia. Um, and then this little, this little like person hat I got from Colombia when I was studying there. And then there's like a little vase that I got from Greece. When I was on vacation there and then I inherited this little chair from a family friend and so I started to kind of grow these little rooms and it's really fun. So Robin, I couldn't help but noticing what looked like a bug tattoo on your arm, an insect ah, yes, tattoo on your yes. arm. Yes, oh yes, yes, yes. This is one of my, this is my first tattoo and this creature is what's called an amblypigid or amblypigy which is a, a particular order of arachnid or commonly known as a tailless whip scorpion. I have a whole bunch of babies here. <laughs> I'm gonna show you. Yes! <laughs> what is remarkable about this particular arachnid is that the mother actually exhibits um, like a maternal behavior where she will use her whips, the long like sensory organs, they're almost like antennae, to stroke the brood to calm them down. And that's not, that is not known in the arachnid world. They're see. kind of like uh, uh, familial, gentle, friendly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Tailless yeah, whip. <laughs> wow. They're beautiful. Thank you. I think one of the fun, uh, interesting things about talking to museum professionals, uh, natural history museum professionals especially, is how 
much it's their passion that drove them into this work, like how it's stuff that often started in their childhood and how it bridges their professional and personal lives. You know, it's not everyone who sort of has the stuff that they work with all the time at their job, little bits of that in their home. Uh, and I think it just shows how much, uh, how much of this is driven by personal interest and excitement and, and, and the joy of doing the work. Totally, totally. And we asked everybody what they, what the first thing they wanted to do when they got back into the museum was. And I felt all of this like curiosity and enthusiasm kind of beaming off of them because so many people that we talked to said stuff like they wanted to go visit their fossils and they missed their fossils or they wanted to go like pet the specimen that they study, you know, like the taxidermy specimen or the pelts. Um, and I totally appreciated that. Like they truly love what they do and that came through so clearly and that was amazing to see. Thank you so much for showing us. Uh, yeah, all of thank you. So that was us talking to the Field Museum at home. Tell us what other institutions are full of amazing people doing cool work and whose apartments you might want to see inside. Thanks for watching. As always, if you enjoyed this, click the like button. Click to subscribe uh, and we'll see you soon.